The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15707 in the name of Gordon MacDonald on hardline visa controls impact on Edinburgh festivals. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Gordon MacDonald to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Edinburgh Festival is the world's largest arts festival, and Edinburgh is well recognised as the world's leading festival city. However, our reputation is being damaged and our international positioning being put at risk because of the UK government's hostile immigration policy. Artists are facing a humiliating application process, their visas are being refused, and due to inaction from the UK government to resolve this issue, artists are being deterred from coming here. Performers not only entertain us, but they educate us about other culture, cultures, and as a result, our society is enriched. But not only is this visa issue damaging for our culture, but it's damaging to our economy. During the course of a year, the Edinburgh Festival see audiences of a staggering 4.7 million come from all over the world, generating an economic impact of £280 million in Edinburgh and a total of £313 million across Scotland. And whilst we see the Scottish Government, art industry and artists themselves trying to improve, grow and develop our festivals, the UK Government's hostile environment immigration system risks the future of Edinburgh festivals. Amnesty in their briefing stated that participants of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and the International Festival that are defined as permit-free festivals were still required to undergo an application process identical to that of a standard visitor's visa if their nationality warranted a visa requirement for the UK. Amnesty described the overall picture as grim with visa issues posing serious challenges for those involved in organising the Edinburgh Festival. Two thirds of respondents said that performers they were working with had experienced visa refusals. We need, to, we need everyone to come together on this and look at developing something similar to cultural passports for individuals participating in festivals around the country. Something that will address the particular issues that the festivals are facing onerous visitor visa evidence requirements, long periods of passport retention, cost to UK festivals of sponsorships, short duration visitor visas, restrictive salary conditions, and the inability for festivals to invite young or emerging artists. Presiding officer, I want to highlight a few examples of how this is affecting the industry, but I also want to be clear that these are just a few examples. There are many, many more. Last year, at the International Book Festival, about a dozen individuals went through the extremely difficult process of trying to obtain a visa. They were from the Middle East and African countries. These artists all had their applications refused at least once, and several of the applications were outstanding with less than a week before they were due to appear at the festival. One artist was told he had too much money and it looked suspicious for a short trip. Another was told she didn't have enough, so she transferred £500 into the account and was then told that the £500 looked suspicious. Artists are being asked to provide three years' worth of bank statements to demonstrate financial independence, despite festivals like the Book Festival paying the artists to participate in their festival and guaranteeing to cover their costs while in the UK. Nick Barley, the director of the Edinburgh International Book Festival, described one particular situation where one author had to give his birth certificate, marriage certificate, his daughter's birth certificate, and then had to go for biometric testing. The artist then wanted to back out of his participation in the festival at that point because he couldn't bear it. Nick Barley has said that their relationship with authors is being damaged because the system is completely unfit for purpose and described the process as humiliating and Kafkaesque. In 2017, Kachita Wurst, the 2014 Eurovision winner, pulled out of the Edinburgh International Festival because her Syrian band members, who had been living in Vienna for three years, was denied visas. Ironically, 
She had been due to perform at a concert celebrating the importance of immigration in European culture. That same year, the Arabs Art Showcase had a third of their visas denied more than once. This included their technical director, who was given the wrong type of visa by the Home Office, two dancers with solo shows, and almost their entire marketing team. One of their shows had to be cancelled completely, and they spent around £6,000 on the process. Will do. Yep. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much to, to the member for taking the intervention. Um, is he aware as to whether these problems have increased uh, in recent years? Has it been a long-standing issue, or has it uh, just, just cropped up you know, more recently? Can you give some sense from his own uh, research? Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much for that. Um, my understanding is steadily getting worse, but we're now at the point where visas are getting applied for, for the festival in August. So we will find out in a couple of months' time whether the circumstances have changed but the better, but my, my gut feeling isn't, it hasn't improved at all. So, Sarah Sharawi, who was a project manager of the Arab Art Showcase, has said the following. How the Home Office dealt with us was appalling, and the reasons of refusal were flat out lies. We had a crew member that was refused because he'd never been in the UK, when the reality was he'd been in the UK with a show in 2009, and 2012. We had a Palestinian dancer who applied twice, and one of the refusals letters spoke repeatedly about their circumstances in Egypt, when the reality was he wasn't based in Egypt. One letter was simply empty. They didn't remember to fill in the reason of refusal section. Following the number of visa denials in 2017, Amnesty International in Scotland surveyed Edinburgh Festival organisers and companies to find out the impact of the visa process in the UK on their work. Festival organisers reported multiple visa denials and the knock-on effect of cancelled shows and considerable stress and pressure within organisations. And this issue is not just affecting artists and festivals in Scotland, it's UK-wide. English Pen has said that the visa process is complex and humiliating and presents the UK as a place that has closed its doors to international culture. Does the member give way? Yep. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I realise that he is focused on festivals, but would you agree that this is also a problem for conferences eh, and a range of other reasons that people would want to come to this country short term? Gordon MacDonald. Absolutely, I would agree with that. Um, Directors of, of Britain's biggest international festivals came together last year to sign an open letter warning the UK government of the risk to festivals because of Home Office visa application procedures. The letter signed by 25 festival directors from across the UK said that the current visa application process for artists is lengthy, opaque and costly. It went on to say the situation has led to artists now telling festivals they are much more reluctant to accept invitations to come to the UK due to the visa process. This is unacceptable. Scotland is known as an inclusive and welcoming place, but our reputation as a global gathering place has been put at risk by narrow-minded, xenophobic Tory policies. As my Edinburgh colleague Deirdre Brock MP has said, musicians, writers and performers have become collateral damage cut up in the Tories' hostile approach to immigration. Unless things change now, this situation is only going to get worse as the Tories continue hell-bent on a no-deal Brexit. An immigration bill is currently going through the Westminster Parliament. Mm -hmm. They should bring in amendments to tackle the issues raised and act now. If they won't, then they should devolve immigration and let the Scottish Government get on with building a fair and functional immigration system fit for the 21st century. <laughs> We move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please. And I call Andy Whiteman, followed by John McAlpine. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. I, first of all, would like to apologise to the Chamber. Um, I need to leave at half past one to have a freestanding commitment to a meeting with the Minister. I know how busy Minister's diaries are, so thank you very much. And uh, particularly welcome uh, this debate brought by Gordon MacDonald. I think it's extremely important and congratulate him on his own research and his opening remarks, which... Um, spell out the nature uh, of this problem. Uh, as members are aware, as Gordon MacDonald himself said, Edinburgh's festivals are, are world uh, famous, they're successful. 
They're a celebration of much that's good about the human spirit, and they bring together diverse cultures and peoples and continue to contribute to the founding vision uh, of the Edinburgh International Festival, forged in the aftermath of the horrors of Nazism uh, and genocide. And Gordon MacDonald quoted from Amnesty's uh, briefing. I'd like to thank Amnesty for a very good briefing on this topic, which I think has helped members to get to grips with what can sometimes be a rather difficult uh, topic. Um, and as Gordon also said uh, in response to my intervention, um, the situation has, I think it's fair to say, reached something of a crisis point, uh, and there's no signs that it's going to improve uh, any time uh, soon. And as he also said, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and International Festival are designated as permit-free, uh, meaning that performers and legitimate entourages can come here without the need for a work permit, but do uh, still need to um, apply for a conventional uh, visa. Uh, and this seems to be uh, increasingly uh, out of step with the uh, role that tourism uh, and culture are playing, not just in the economy of Scotland, but uh, in the economy uh, of the UK uh, as well. And in recent years, in 2017, for example, we had the high-profile case uh, of the Austrian singer Conchita Wurst, who was forced to cancel her performance uh, after her band members were denied uh, visas. But it's not just high-profile uh, acts that have issues with the, the Home Office. I was contacted last year by a constituent having an issue with a visa for the, for the book festival, and Gordon MacDonald mentioned a few uh, of those. Um, they had a young family uh, who, in fact, had British citizenship, but due to Home Office rules, they couldn't find a way uh, to enter the UK from uh, New Zealand. And this was the uh, book festival, of course, a festival that doesn't have permit-free status. But even if it did, uh, as Amnesty made clear, uh, artists are still faced with a labyrinth of the visa application uh, process. And what Amnesty also tell us is that some venues and programmers are concerned, continue to be concerned, that visa issues would compromise festival programs in the future. And I think it's a really serious issue. Um, and notwithstanding the immediate problems that artists face, I think this is the key issue we need to stress to the UK government. As Gordon MacDonald said, the UK cannot be a place uh, that um, has an important cultural component to its economy uh, unless it's easy for artists to travel uh, here. Indeed, one venue said it hoped to continue working with visa-sensitive countries, but was concerned at the high costs uh, alone and that alone made the venue very cautious uh, to book shows uh, in the future. Uh, two venues have stated that they forced to reconsider the feasibility of projects uh, involving performers for cer from certain countries, uh, one noting that it had forced to rethink bringing artists, for example, from some Arab countries. And this cannot continue. Presiding officers, Gordon MacDonald said, Scotland presides, pr pr prides itself on our welcome to visitors and those from out with Scotland who wish to make their home here. And it's not possible to realize these ambitions of some of those with the most to offer in the cultural sphere being denied access uh, to perform and to attend uh, events in Edinburgh uh, and elsewhere. So in conclusion, I thank Gordon MacDonald once again, and I am sure, I and I'm sure other members would be very happy to be part of a wider focused campaign that seeks to resolve these matters as soon as possible, and especially in the light of any new restrictions that may be coming in the aftermath of Brexit. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to take this opportunity to thank Gordon MacDonald uh, for bringing this debate to Parliament. It, do you want me to carry on? I can sit down. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Carlton. I don't know how I, how can I miss you? That's, that's very good of you, Ms. Hamilton. Sorry. Okay, I think we'll have Joan McAlpin. And I think we'll follow her by... I'm all confused now. Rachel Hamilton? <laughs> no. <laughs> Joan McAlpin. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And, and can I start by... I'll, I'll, I would have given way to Rachel Hamilton, but I do have to leave. Um, so apologies for that. So I'm going to take the opportunity to speak now. Um, I'd like to welcome Don Gordon MacDonald, MSP's... Um, success in securing this very important debate. It is now almost a year since Nick Barley, the director of the Edinburgh International Book Festival, spoke out about the humiliating treatment of visiting authors by the UK. And he wasn't alone. In fact, he was one of 25 festival directors who last year signed an open letter complaining about the situation. Uh, Gordon MacDonald has outlined the nightmare of the current situation very well. And I want to say a bit more about how it could get even worse in the event of a, a no deal 
Brexit, because of course these visa difficulties do not at the moment extend to the 500 million citizens of Europe who enjoy uh, free movement uh, to work, travel, do business and enjoy cultures right across Europe. And what an added nightmare if the strong links uh, that we have with artists from EU countries suffered the same damage that the UK seems determined to inflict uh, to our relationships with artists and cultural tourists from the rest of the world. After Nick Barley addressed this Parliament's cross-party group on culture uh, on this issue last year, uh, the CPG wrote collectively to David Liddington, the Deputy Prime Minister, about our concerns. We asked him to safeguard the ability of the cultural sector to move freely in order to continue to gain employment from European clients. And we pointed out that Scotland's cultural sector has many European clients. The European industry enables careers to be viable outside of London, particularly uh, where most of the work sect of the sector is based. And this makes freedom of movement particularly important to those based in Scotland who have less employment locally than somewhere like London, for example. Uh, we told Mr Liddington the economic benefits of cultural tourism are well known. The cultural sector needs to be able to access European talent, and this includes performers to play at festivals, major events and companies, as well as educators to teach at our universities and cultural institutions. And this is particularly the case for smaller scale enterprises, uh, which could close um, we, we told Mr Liddington as they would be unable to withstand the potential, potentially prohibitive visa, work permit, administration and management costs um, in the event of a no-deal Brexit. The European Parliament Culture and Education Committee is very much aware uh, of this threat. Um, uh, the threat, that is, of obstacles to mobility for cultural workers. And it, it had an inquiry into this topic and it highlighted three areas of difficulty. One is the recognition of specific working regimes of artists and cultural professionals. Another is withholding tax and social security rules. And the third is the issue of travel documents. And those are the obstacles that face cultural workers at the moment. Uh, now, the UK government white paper does contain a so-called cultural accord, uh, but Culture Counts, who are the secretariat to the CPG, point out that this cultural accord does not address the three barriers which were outlined by the European Parliament's Culture and Education Committee, and neither does the withdrawal agreement, because although um, the political declaration hints at visa-free travel, uh, the withdrawal agreement certainly doesn't, and of course, with no deal, uh, we are completely up in the air. The UK single market um, uh, is, of course, uh, not something that the withdrawal agreement uh, uh, um, uh, guarantees. Um, in fact, the red lines of the UK government means that we're leaving uh, the single market. And of course, the single market covers services and creative industries are service industries. We did get a reply, um, not from Mr Liddington, but from uh, the DCMS Minister Michael Ellis. And Mr Ellis acknowledged the very important role of arts and artists. Indeed, he suggested that it was the strength of the creative sector that had resulted in the UK obtaining number one place in the Portland Soft Power Index. How long that will last after Brexit's made Britain a laughing stock, we don't know. However, in response to the CPG's concerns about the end of freedom of movement, he had not one single crumb of comfort. His letter simply stated, the UK government is clear that freedom of movement will end as we leave the EU. Uh, there was some mention of reciprocal arrangements in the letter for business travellers in the withdrawal agreement, which of course um, now is dead in the water, but nothing um, in the, uh, on the cultural sector whatsoever. It was of deep concern to the CPG and continues to be of deep concern to the CPG. And that's why we have to uh, ensure that we call a halt to Brexit because a withdrawal agreement would obviously, uh, uh, no deal Brexit would obviously be disastrous uh, for the economy as a whole and particularly disastrous for the cultural sector. Thank you. Right, we're back on track. Rachel Hamilton followed by Sandra White. Thank you, presiding officer, and thank you also to Gordon MacDonald for bringing what is quite a difficult subject to talk about. Um, however, I have looked at and spoken to my colleagues about some of the issues that he does raise, and I have found that uh, not one of them has come to me to speak about this. And I just think it's, it's an issue that, as an Edinburgh MSP, um, you know, I would like to hear more about those difficulties because that would enable us to feed in to uh, the future 
um, agreement, perhaps. And I would, uh, in this opportunity, like to say that I do not want to see uh, a no deal. But I'd also like to take the opportunity uh, to herald the success of the Edinburgh festivals as they are fast approaching, um, because we must do that within this debate as well. And the diversity and participation in the festivals is so important. It's an exciting time for Scotland's cultural calendar, attracting over 4 million people from all over Scotland. Just a bit of background to the festivals. We, we, we enjoy the festivals, most of us enjoy the festivals, um, but uh, it's the largest art festival in the world um, with live theatre and comedy performances. And that's why speaking about um, the visa applications for artists is so important because so many people are involved. On average, the festival presents over 150 performances involving two and a half thousand artists. And we see huge audiences too um, in the region of around about 400,000 a year. And the capital does come alive with the visitors from around the world and overseas tourism to Scotland has risen by 10% in a year while the number of European tourists jumped to, by 19% and the attractiveness of the festival continues to grow. And I hope that we can continue to have a positive uh, outlook about the festival and those people coming towards us, uh, uh, to Scotland that is. With regards to um, the visa controls, presiding officer, the, as we've heard today, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe is a permit-free festival, which does mean that performers and their legitimate entour uh, entourages, as Andy Whiteman says, do not need to obtain work permits, permits to appear in the UK. And I agree that simplicity is absolutely the key. The, the visa application process should be uh, uh, one of simplicity. And I am concerned that Gordon MacDonald is talking about um, some of the issues that some of the artists are having. But performers and entourages at permit-free festivals enter the UK as a standard visitor and do not need to apply for entry under the points-based system or as a permitted paid engagements visitor. However, as Andy Whiteman did say, they may need to apply for a visa, such as those from non-EU countries, and those are listed, and the festival gives guidelines in order to be able to do that. Um, but let me be clear, nothing has changed regarding EU countries, and in the future, as we leave the EU, EU citizens will still be able to participate in the fringe, just as they can today, because it is a permit-free festival. But the music industry, interestingly, is calling for the introduction of an EU-wide touring vi visa. And the government should pursue this when looking into our future relationship with the European Union. Indeed, the idea, again, of a cultural passport is an interesting one. Yes. Andy Whiteman. Rachel Hampton for, for giving way. She says that EU citizens will still be able to come to the festival, and the Fringe particularly is a free festival. But, of course, many European artists don't come here in their own account. They come here as part of... Uh, entourages or ensembles who include amongst their number people who have visa requirements to enter the UK. Does she accept that? We'll continue Rachel to be difficult. Hamilton. Well, there are non-EU countries that are listed in the, uh, um, the festival guidelines, and yes, they do have to have EU uh, visa um, permits to be able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the um, nature of Andy Whiteman's point here, but I'm happy, again, because I'm very interested in learning of the issues um, that currently are happening and would uh, very much like to um, discuss that with both Gordon and Andy Whiteman. Um, yes, I was just saying that, indeed, the uh, cultural passport is um, a very good idea and perhaps should be pursued. But just to wait one last point, because I know time is of the essence, but I don't believe that negativity caused um, in the wording of the motion today does anyone any favours. And despite us leaving the EU, visitors, we must make visitors very welcome to Scotland and the UK, and they can continue to perform in festivals just as the way they've always done, and long may this continue. Thank you. Sandra White, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I absolutely congratulate Gordon MacDonald for securing this debate. It's a very interesting one. And as someone who's coming from Glasgow, I know the Celtic Connections uh, also have this problem too, but this is based in the Edinburgh part. But if I could just possibly pick up the issue that John Mason raised about the overall issue of visas. 
is very, very important. And obviously, we just had uh, Sabir Aziz, chief executive of the Scottish Refugee Council's father was refused entry. Uh, but now, thankfully, with support from others, he has got that visa. So I think it's important to remember it does affect various people. The point I wanted to make also was, and I think Rachel Hamilton uh, not so much reminded me of it, but I think it's the most important point. Rachel Hamilton mentioned EU citizens. And also, Gordon MacDonald mentioned that the vast majority of people who refuse visa come from the Middle East and Africa. And I find that uh, that is the case. And I've had a number, a great number of people coming particularly from the Middle East, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria. These are the people who are refused visas. And if I could just give you a couple of examples. Now, I had a Mr. Mahmoud Akbar, an award-winning photographer, wanting permission last year, November 2017. He wasn't given that permission. He was exhibiting his work in Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow also, not just in Edinburgh. He was not allowed to enter. He came from Palestine. Another person I had, actually a number of people I had, was uh, Freedom to Run, which was coming to Edinburgh also. And this was actually an organi organisation of right to movement. Now, they were coming to Edinburgh in May to run the marathon in Edinburgh. They were refused entry also. But similar to the previous one I mentioned, with a lot of hard work and appeals, we managed to get these people here. So a lot of hard work. But these people had, were sitting about for months, months, not knowing if they could enter or not. And that is the biggest problem. It's the Middle East and Africa. It's not so much Europe. And Andy Whiteman's absolutely right. They don't just come individually. They come as part of an entourage as well. And I think that's something we have to uh, realise. And I hope if we get numbers, we will see the discrepancies. And actually, I would say biased against people from the Middle East. Being able to come to Edinburgh and perform either individually or part of an entourage or a group at the Edinburgh Festival and other festivals also, Celtic Connections, whatever it may be. Now, I recently had another application who asked me to look into the, the application. This gentleman came from Gaza, also in Palestine, and was basically asked very invasive questions about was he going to come back, was he going to go back to Gaza? The chap's got a job, he's got a family, he supports his family. Of course he's going to go back to his home country and support his family. He is world-renowned, this particular gentleman, and yet he was refused a visa also to come to Edinburgh. We have tried everything. In fact, I actually had booked rooms in the Parliament here for, for the chap. He would have been here two weeks ago in May. He received permission from the Scottish Parliament to come and exhibit his work here in the Parliament, but he didn't get the visa to come here. Now, there's something far wrong when you have renowned artists throughout the world, and just because they come from a certain part of the world, mostly the Middle East and Africa, not necessarily Europeans, they are not allowed. They're asked invasive questions, they have to jump through don't know how many hoops, and thankfully, sometimes they are successful. But this gentleman, four years it took him to produce this exhibition, and in two days, that was ruined, simply because the Home Office did not give him permission. Yet this Parliament could actually email him and say, we have the, 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 things, the event set up for you, <clears throat> we'd sent invitations out, and it couldn't happen. So I think when you're talking about cultural passports, I think that's a great idea, and I don't know how we're going to look at that, but I just say I'm thankful that Gordon raised this today, because I think it's high time we looked at who's actually allowed to come into this country and who's actually not. Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> the last of the open debate contributions is from Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I welcome Gordon MacDonald bringing this issue to the Chamber. As others have said, Edinburgh Festival secures audiences of 4.5 million, delivering over 3,000 events each year. They generate an annual economic impact of some £280 million in Edinburgh and 313 across Scotland. So for over 70 years, the city has built its enviable reputation as a world leader, delivering individual festivals which have a global cultural impact. Almost a third of the annual visitors to Scotland are motivated by the cultural and heritage offer which the festivals play a key role in. With, sorry, with participants from eight to five countries taking part in the festivals in 2017, their ability to attract and welcome global artists is critical to their success. 
It is clear that the approach of the Immigration Service is undermining that, is damaging the reputation of the UK and consequently the Edinburgh Festivals as a welcoming destination for performers from across the world. Incidences of performers being denied visas appear to be increasing, resulting in additional costs, inconvenience and stress for all those involved. Julia Armour, the Director of Festivals Edinburgh, has warned the current approach risks putting artists off coming to the UK, while Nick Barley, as others have said, Director of the Edinburgh International Book Festival, has spoken of up to a dozen performers from Africa and the Middle East having serious delays to their applications for last year's events, with some having to reapply several times or even cancel their plans to participate. In the briefing for this debate, Amnesty International highlighted a survey of festival organisers and venues in 2017, which highlighted that visa issues posed a serious challenge for organisers. Two thirds of those surveyed said performers they worked with had experienced visa refusals, including a number from Iran, Egypt, Syria, Palestine, Sudan and Lebanon. These refusals resulted in performances being cancelled or taking place with limited cast and crew. They also meant that some venues are now more cautious in terms of bookings which involve performers from certain countries. There's a clear emphasis on Middle Eastern artists and Arab arts focus say that half of their performers had visa applications declined. These issues, of course, are not just restricted to Edinburgh festivals, but impact on events throughout the UK, underlining the need for a UK system that recognises the legitimate requirements of performers and other international guests visiting the UK. Organisers of the WOMAD Festival, for example, have reported acts were turning down invitations as a, to perform as a result of the difficult and humiliating visa processes they were having to go through. While the current system attempts to make provision for entertainer visitors for specific permit-free festivals, such as Edinburgh Festival Fringe and the International Festival, not all events are covered by these definitions and carrying different requirements. It's also reported that even in instances where performers can apply for visas as entertainer visitors, the process is actually the same as a standard visitor and refusal under either scheme is a high probability for performers from a number of countries. The approach that the Home Office is taking to short-term visa applications is inconsistent, affecting Middle Eastern and African countries it is, sorry, and lacking in clarity. It is clearly, it's clear that its impact is damaging and providing a deterrent to viable applications. The changes, have made it, the changes have already made it more difficult, if indeed not impossible, for some legitimate performers to take part in events to the detriment of our cultural life and expression. The House of Lords recently held a debate on the movement of people in the cultural sector, which highlighted recommendations in a committee report calling for consideration of a EU-wide multi-entry touring visa post-Brexit. The debate criticised the failure of the UK government to respond to these recommendations, highlighting the need for a more thorough consideration of how the immigration system can and does impact on the cultural sector. The UK government does need to change its approach to immigration, and it needs to recognise how damaging their current approach is having on the richness of our cultural events. We want Edinburgh, Scotland and the UK to be seen as a welcoming place for all cultures. Indeed, this is key to the continuing success of our festivals and our wider tourism appeal. Events like the Edinburgh Festival rely on an ability to attract the very best talent from around the world. It offers performers an opportunity to apply their creative skills and talent and a world-leading showcase. Visa processes should be supporting rather than hampering our cultural exchange. And the system overseen by the Home Office is increasingly hostile and a threat to the vibrancy of our festivals. They must take action to fix this. I now call Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate for around seven minutes. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to be concluding today's debate on this most important issue. I'm grateful to Gordon MacDonald for bringing the motion to the Chamber and also to Deirdre Brock MP for Edinburgh North and Leith for her ongoing support of Edinburgh International Festivals on this issue. The Scottish Government has long-standing concerns around how readily artists and performers can come to Scotland for the Edinburgh International Festivals and the problems that delayed visa processes, refusals, and indeed refusals which are then overturned at the very last minute can cause festival organizers of all sizes. Year on year, festivals across Scotland and indeed the United Kingdom have been plagued by uncertainty around visas. Sometimes even the same artists repeat issues one year to the next, and, and this is unacceptable. But it's not simply a matter of timeliness. It is our international standing as a leading centre of global cultural discovery that is also jeopardised. Something has to change. 
Two years ago, I actually attended the new European Songbook at the Edinburgh International Festival, where Eurovision Song Contest winner Conchita Wurst was due to perform alongside her band Basalt. That was the case referred to by Gordon MacDonald. And despite a supporting statement from the festival, each of the three Syrian band members had their visa applications denied. As a di direct result, the performance was uh, uh, cancelled, causing last minute changes to the festival programme, disappointment for those attending and embarrassment for the event organisers. Now, this was a Scottish Government Expo funded, British Council supported Edinburgh International Festival event where the Austrian broadcasting company was the lead broadcaster and it was the Austrian performance that couldn't take place. So it's beyond belief. Does the UK Home Office not realise how bad this looks, let alone the effect on the individual artists? Last year, uh, Nairouz uh, Kamrit, a uh, Palestinian writer and TV journalist, had her visitor visa to attend the International Book Festival denied not once but three times having started the process in April of that year. Eventually, our application was granted, but not before she had missed the original event she was billed to appear at. Now, John Mason also asked about business events. Uh, this weekend, Glasgow is hosting the World Editors uh, Congress, uh, and we have reports of delegates being refused visas by the UK Home Office. So they're now parading this hostility in front of the world's press. Uh, Rachel Hamilton referred to uh, permit-free uh, festivals. Uh, of course, the duration of permit-paid engagement is only one month, and quite clearly, if you're travelling across the world, you might want onward engagements. Uh, the visa is not open to emerging artists or under-18s. Now, although the Edinburgh Fringe are keen to re retain that permit-free festival status, that route could and should be approved. But in relation to uh, the situation we find ourselves in, every year it seems the internationalism of our festivals and the open and welcoming message we strive to send risks being confused and muddied by persistent visa issues that prevent and delay those wishing to visit and contribute their creativity and culture. The Scottish Government has regularly raised concert, uh, concerns with the UK Government around the challenges for international artists and performers coming to participate in our festivals. Indeed, these are issues that occurred long before the added chaos and uncertainty foisted upon us by Brexit. Now, Brexit, as Joe McAlpine identified, now threatens to extend these problems to EU citizens, as detailed in the UK government's white paper on immigration. A better solution for visiting artists, performers and others must be integral to any future immigration system. And that's particularly important if free freedom of movement is to end and the UK leaves the EU and European visitors are made to comply with the Home Office is increasingly burdensome and complex rules. In their white paper, the UK government outlines a commitment to redesign and simplify the implementation and operation of the immigration system. And it's crucial that they seize this opportunity to ensure that the issues from the past and of the present are not replicated in the future. The current visa application processes for visitors coming to Scotland for international events is lengthy, complex and costly, with attendees or organisers sometimes spending thousands of pounds on visas and associated costs for a visit that may sometimes only last a few days. The guidance is confusing, the decision making is uncertain and there is no right to appeal to review. The Scottish Government will continue to argue for a system that works for everyone. I fully recognise the need to find solutions in conjunction with those who experience these systems firsthand. And that is why I work and have been working with uh, organisers of festivals, conferences and events of all sizes to ensure that their contribution to Scotland's reputation as a place of artistic diversity and exchange is recognised. Indeed, the messages we hear each time we meet with leaders and representatives from across um, Scotland's cultural life is clear and consistent. So whilst short-term technical changes to immigration rules are a step in the right direction, a wider, more meaningful shift is needed in the way the UK government operates its policy towards the myriad of visiting members from the world's creative communities. Presiding officer, I can inform the Parliament that I have written to the Home Secretary asking the Home Office to work with the Scottish Government and other devolved administrations to proactively and meaningfully address the challenges of the existing visa system for artists and performers. I will be inviting the Home Secretary and counterparts in the devolved administrations to an International Festivals Visa Summit in Edinburgh, where in the home of the world's biggest arts festival, we can openly discuss our shared concerns and work together to find solutions to protect our reputation as an outward-looking, welcoming country. Presiding officer, let me conclude by reiterating that this parliament 
is committed to protecting Scotland's international cultural standing and remains proud of our capital being the world's leading festival city. And to those who face challenges in coming here, we are clear. Scotland remains open, open to the unrivaled pleasure of the arts, open to culture exchange and open to business. It is time that the immigration system recognised this. That concludes the debate and this meeting is suspended until 2.30pm.